On Thursday, coordinators Eric Bieniemy, Jack Del Rio, and Nate Katzer met with the media, and I've got a lot of comments and a lot of thoughts on their comments coming up on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into this Friday episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, and you can continue the conversation over on subtext at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders where you can go one-on-one with me because I am your host, David Harrison, D Harrison 82 on Twitter, credential member of the media and Washington commanders beat reporter for commander country sports illustrated's fan nation site covering the commanders here with you every Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, I appreciate you for coming through and your continued support for the show. If you're new to the show, Welcome. I hope you stick with us through the quote unquote NFL dead period, which is about to come in here a couple of weeks, but we will still be with you here five days a week through that period previewing uh, training camp. But before we get to all that, we've got comments today from uh, the Washington Commanders coordinators. And of course, we've got a mandatory mini camp coming up next week, three days of practice anticipated next week. So plenty more material uh, coming from that as well. And that will help take us into our month, month and a half or so of no team activities before training camp gets everything started. And guys, we're almost right back into the thick of things. So comments from assistant head coach and offensive coordinator, Eric Bieniemy, defensive coordinator, Jack Del Rio and special teams coordinator, Nate Katz are coming up on today's episode of locked on commanders, but we're going to start with coach Bieniemy. He was the first one we spoke to. So we're going to start there and we're going to start with the quarterback, Sam Howell, coach Bieniemy on Sam Howell said, quote, well, first of all, Sam's a very competitive kid. The thing I love about him too, he's smart. He understands some of the times when he's making mistakes. And the only thing he wants to know is what can he do to get better more than anything. I'm enjoying just watching him work and watching how he handles the highs and the lows. Cause you're going to have some of that throughout the course of working during the off season, just like you would if you weren't playing in the game. But the thing that I love about him is that he's always staying steady. His demeanor does not change and he's very, very competitive. And I will say this, he auto corrects himself as well because he knows exactly what he did and what he should have done which is a good thing, end quote. So Eric bien first and foremost, t- twice, right? If I count correctly, twice, what I love about Sam Howell. So obviously Eric bien uh, is feeling some Sam Howell here in the early going parts coming out of the OTAs. A couple of things that Eric bien mentioned there that I really kind of want to expand on, the competitive nature and the zero difference between Sam when he was getting his first start last year and the week bef- the weeks before in the season. Uh, as far as his demeanor com- comes in, every day is, Those of you who've been with this program for for a while now, you might remember I kind of told the story last year when it was announced that Sam Howell was going to get the start against the Dallas Cowboys and kind of going through that week uh, of that preparation with Sam for for how he was preparing for that first career start and and the big divisional game and all this stuff. You know, the playoffs were not in in grasp, right? So uh, not all the things were on the line, but still a very big moment in a young player's uh, career, right? And what really stood out to me going back to that Week 18 experience is that the Sam Howell that I have been kind of having side conversations with and just little conversations with here uh, th- here and there throughout the weeks leading up to that, that Week 18 matchup was the exact same Sam Howell that I got in Week 18. In fact, there was one moment, and some of you might remember the story, where, you know, kind of sitting in the locker room waiting for the next scrum or waiting for the next, you know, player that I want to interview and, and get a quote from and all these other things. And Sam walked in and had his his like a Kai Superberry, you know, superfood bowl that the, the players eat. Uh, following practice and he walked by and I, I'm kind of standing there. I'm like, you know, usually like the number one quarterback he's studying, he's, he's got, you know, uh, things going on. So you kind of leave him alone a little bit. You don't really interact with them on a, on a day to day basis. You kind of, you know, there's a, there's a lot of weight on those shoulders. And as I'm standing there kind of going through that, I'm like, okay, well, Sam is QB one now. So I'm going to kind of let Sam, you know, do his thing or whatever. He actually comes up to me and goes, he goes, what's up? And I just was like, okay, so we're having this normal conversation. And again, so, and I think that really kind of illustrates what Eric Bieniemy is talking about, what he's saying. Like Sam Howell is Sam Howell is Sam Howell, whether it's going great, whether it's going poorly, whether he just threw an interception or just threw a touchdown. One of the most even keel people uh, that you're going to meet in, in a short period of knowing him. So talking to him these past couple of weeks, it's the same thing. Watching him do interviews with Julie Donaldson on the team's website, whatever it is, 
Sam Howell, the Sam Howell that I talked to off the camera, behind the scenes, not on the record, all of these things. It's the same Sam Howell that you guys are seeing in these interviews. And I think that speaks to his mentality, his maturity, and the fact that right now, the moment is definitely not too big for him. Understanding the mistakes and staying centered during the learning process, that's going to help him accentuate his talents and is going to help him learn extremely well uh, throughout this process. So uh, I think the biggest thing too here, every competitor wants to be perfect, right? And Eric Bieniemy did talk during his press conference about uh, trying to strive for perfection and telling his players we're going to strive for perfection because that's what's going to help us win games. But also understanding that not every rep is going to be perfect. Not every snap is going to go perfectly, but the key is to learn and continue to strive for that perfection. I don't get the sense that Sam Howell comes out onto the field and expects himself to get everything right the first time, but he does want to work towards that perfection. And that's where that autocorrect turns uh, comes in. And this might be the only time that I've ever used the term autocorrect in a positive light because typically I despise autocorrect, but the fact that Sam Howell isn't able to identify the deficiency, identify the mistake that was made, and then correct it before even going back to his coaches, but then getting with his coaches. Uh, we talked about this previously this week, uh, coming from Sam himself, going and getting that coaching from Eric Bieniemy, from Ron Rivera, getting further down the rabbit hole as far as has how to uh, correct those things and to get better. So all of those things, certainly uh, shining spots for Sam Howell here in the early going in through the OTAs. We've got three practices coming up next week. It's going to be really interesting and really important, I think, to see these three days back to back to back and see how the production and the play and the practice performance goes consistently uh, throughout the week. So moving on from Sam Howell, the quarterback, Eric Bieniemy was also asked about the tight end room. And of course, the tight end room has become a little bit more uh, of a focal point, right, since the injury suffered by Armani Rogers and whether or not Curtis Hodges was going to be able to step up and really take that place. And so far, again, it's only been two practices, right, since Armani Rogers uh, was injured. And we've we've seen some really good things out of Curtis so far. But we've also seen good things out of the other tight ends. And Eric Bieniemy talking about his tight end room, said, quote, you know what? The tight end room is, is doing a heck of a job. Coach Todd Storm, the position coach, has done a hell of a job with those guys. I mean, Logan Thomas, John Bates, Cole Turner, Curtis Hodges, those guys are doing a heck of a job. In fact, those guys have stood out for all the right reasons. Obviously, in this offense, it's always been a tight end friendly offense. Those guys, they show up, they're making plays, and the quarterbacks have been doing a great job of locating them in the passing game. I think from top down, the depth is pretty good, and I'm just proud of where we are at this particular point in time. End quote. Now, it's important to remember, and it's important to always kind of qualify this, right? And EB did say during the press conference that they are still in the infant stages of really developing and installing this offense, right? So, all of these positives, they are positives, but they're positives now. They're positives in OTA. So it's, it's important to contextualize everything they're saying. This is not saying that everything we're seeing now, boom, you could go into week one today and win an NFL football game. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is positives coming out of OTAs, two weeks, six practices uh, on the field uh, from, from a real competitive standpoint. So again, that, that, that contextualization, understanding what we're talking about, that grain of salt, so to speak. Uh, is, is very important here, I think. But the depth of this tight end room is something that we've been talking about, not just this year, but for years past. And this is the third time in the past two weeks that we've been told from a different person in a different setting under a different question how tight end friendly this offense is. So you may be wanting to eye some tight ends here uh, for your fantasy rosters. And if you were a little disappointed about adding Cole Turner to your uh, dynasty franchise or fantasy roster, maybe be a little bit more patient and, and kind of stick with them for a little bit, right? Seeing flashes of ability of playmaking so far, something EB was talking about. This this has me wondering a little bit, and this is something I'm, I'm going to be looking for next week. Again, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back practices, opportunity to see this team three days in a row. Logan Thomas has been making some plays. Cole Turner has been making some plays. Curtis Hodges has been making some plays. Haven't seen a lot of John Bates, so I'm going to keep my eye out on John Bates. Something to watch for again next week during uh, the three-day mini camp. But of course, before we get to that three day mini camp, we got to finish this week and, and uh, enjoy the weekend. Hopefully all of you are going to have a nice, safe, good weather weekend. We're going to change sides of the ball in today's episode. We're going to talk about defensive coordinator Jack Del Rio and some of his comments on Thursday after the conclusion of Washington's OTA practices. That's coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked On Commanders is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers, you can get a no sweat first bet up to 
$2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. NBA Finals Game 1 between the Miami Heat and the Denver Nuggets took place Thursday night. So we'll have updated series odds in our next FanDuel sponsored episode. But there still might be some current NBA Finals prop bets that are still available at the time that you're watching or listening to this episode. It's like Nugget Center, Nikola Jokic getting minus 125 odds to record 65 or more points, rebounds, and assists combined in a single game. That's a prop bet you can find at FanDuel or point guard, Nuggets point guard, Jamal Murray, scoring 40 or more points in a single finals game. Uh, That's assuming that the two of them or either of them do not accomplish those feats in game one. Those prop bets will still be available on FanDuel. There's no better place to bet all on all the playoff action than with America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Thanks again, Commanders fans, for making Locked On Commanders your first listen or view today and every day. Every day, make sure you come back next week as we dive deeper into OTA observations and set the stage for what we want to see during the mandatory mini camp next week. I've already got one Eric Bieniemy uh, quote that I had to cut from the first segment uh, to in order to get to our ad uh, on time. So that's something that I will save for Monday's episode. So we've already got more material uh, bleeding over into the next episode. So make sure you're coming through as we cover all of the bases, all of the comments, all of the corners. Continuing today's conversation, we're going to get more comments from defensive coordinator Jack Del Rio, and we're going to talk about comments made by special teams coordinator Nate Katz. Nate Katz, her first, we're going to start off with Jack Del Rio. JDR talking about Emmanuel Forbes, a little short, a little sweet, said, quote, really fired up about getting him, adding him to the squad. I think he's a tremendous football player. You know, he's fast. He's got great ball skills. He's very bright. And he played against some of the best competition that you can bring or you can being in the SEC and held up week in, week out, was a playmaker. Very productive. So happy to get him, end quote. And that playmaking ability we've already seen from Emmanuel Forbes in the rookie minicamp in the OTAs. Uh, playing more slot during the rookie mini camp, but also playing outside a lot more during the OTA sessions. Something else that Jack Del Rio uh, mentioned during his press conference, the team himself, his coach is still very much in kind of the sorting it out phase of just how they're going to use all of these secondary weapons. And that's something that I'm really interested to see because you can make the case for about six or seven of these guys to be every snap guys, but you're not going to put six or seven DBs on the field every snap, right? I don't think, I mean, maybe I don't, yeah, you can't put six or seven on every snap, but you have, like I said, you have about six or seven guys that again, very early OTA period, grain of salt, all that stuff. Right. But very, they're showing these flashes uh, that, that give you a lot of confidence in these guys ability, their IQ. And not only that, but they're fit in this scheme and the ability of these coaches to teach them. So we've already seen that playmaking ability uh, from Emmanuel Forbes that Jack Del Rio is talking about Del Rio. Del Rio also said, uh, like I said, they're still in, in the figuring it out phase, but that Kendall Fuller, Benjamin St. Juice, Emmanuel Forbes, certainly all in the mix to get significant playing time. Uh, we talked a little bit about that as well yesterday. Emmanuel Forbes and fellow rookie Quan Martin, two of the standouts from our second OTA practice with eyes on uh, there at the practice field. Moving on from those guys, JDR also talked about Chase and Montez Sweat, the two defensive ends and their absences. Uh, from OTAs. Now he's a little tight lipped right on Chase Young this time around, simply stating, quote, it's a voluntary time of year. I'm grateful for the guys that are here. I think we're getting a lot of good work in really establishing our culture and putting in a lot of good work. And I'm just appreciative of the guys that are here. End quote. So, you know, don't want to read too much into that. Obviously, he's appreciative of the guys that are there. And that's that's certainly fair. And it is, it's voluntary, right? We kind of talked about this previous to the OTAs, right? Every day, as you remember, you go back, we had our expectation management episode where it's kind of like, okay, how do you really gauge things that are coming out this time of year? And how do you, again, contextualize uh, what is being said this time of year and and keep things kind of into perspective? And again, the absences, it's a voluntary portion of the workout program for a reason. Uh, And again, Coach Rivera talking about the kinds of communication the coaches are still having with these players, despite the fact they're not here. And then talk about a guy like Charles Leno Jr., who's not uh, present, but he worked in this system, worked in this offense when he was in Chicago. So he's got the experience. He was in uh, early part in the early part of the voluntary portion for some of the meetings and some of the film study. So he's, he's been around, just not around during this key portion uh, right here. But 
To be fair, on the flip side of those things, we did talk to running back coach Randy Jordan later on on the day on Thursday. And during that conversation, which I'll get to more of what Randy had to say in an episode next week. But during this conversation, this is kind of applicable. So Candy Waller of Bowie TV asked Coach Jordan how important it was for him to have all three or all three, all of his backs present during the OTAs. And Coach Jordan responded, quote, let me tell you something. It is absolutely critical. The reason why I say that is because, number one, not only just about the X's and the O's, but it's about chemistry. That's what it's about. It's about getting to know people. This is the time to do it because once we get in that grind, we in that grind. It's about building chemistry off the field. And then it's also about build, it's also building chemistry on the field in terms of how we want to do things, not just the plays and learning the playbook, but how do we actually want to play? What can we hang our hat on? And time to find out is now because this is about the trial and error, end quote. So again, trial and error is, is a common thread to this one, right? They're playing Emmanuel Forbes a little bit inside. They play him a little bit outside. They play him on the left. You play him on the right. You play Ben inside. You play him outside. You play Quan up front. You play him in deep. They're, they're, they're messing around with a lot of these guys' alignments and trying to figure out what they feel like is going to work best for the team. And that's how you'll end up with the uh, the the final lineup uh, that you end up. Now, he didn't really. And that so, again, that's Coach Jordan. And then, again, just to contextualize everything, we weren't asking Coach Jordan about Chase Montez or Charles Leno Jr., right? We were asking him about his running backs. But, again, that's one coach's opinion, and he does. He views it as very critical that all of those players in that position group are there because it helps them get their tone set for the season. That doesn't necessarily mean that defensive line coach Jeff Scanina is mad at Chase or mad at Montez for not being there. It's just, again, one coach's opinion. And I felt like that opinion was a little bit applicable to the conversation. So again, in context, and I'll remind everybody, right? So last year, this time, Terry McLaurin was not here for OTAs. Did it really matter? Most people would say that it didn't. But remember, we also talked very early in the season about how much this team was not getting the ball to Terry McLaurin early on. Maybe if he was here this time last year, that could have been helped. Maybe not. That's an alternate dimension reality that we cannot possibly travel down uh, or make any definitive statements about. And certainly, simply, very much not going to blame Terry for uh, for taking the tactics he did and, and earning or getting the contract that he earned. Just saying every decision has an impact. Not all of those impacts are good. Certainly, Coach Jordan is a guy who obviously loves the fact that all of his position guys are here. Jack Del Rio appreciates the defenders that did show up fell short of saying that he doesn't appreciate the ones who didn't show up. But again, two, two coach opinions on similar topics. Decipher that as you will. But Jack did talk about Montez Sweat, not about him not being in OTAs, but about him finishing more in 2023, saying, quote, that'll be the challenge. I think that was really the message for Deron Payne going into last year. He was very disruptive the year before and left a lot on the plate. I think Montez is in a similar situation. I think he's been very close very disruptive, done a lot of really good things. I mean, he's a good football player. And when he starts finishing at a higher rate, his numbers are going to explode. I anticipate him having that kind of year for us. He needs to have that for himself, and we'd like to see it for our team. So a high bar sweat, a high bar set for Montez Sweat. But with the amount of money this team has invested on the defense, it's almost harder to get a new contract at this point because more guys are getting paychecks ahead of you. The tighter the wallet gets, the harder it is to get the team to open it back up, so to speak. Speaking of high expectations, third-year linebacker Jamin Davis has been present during OTAs, but not participating in the running and the in the full team drills because he's at a walkthrough pace. Uh, we're still recovering from a minor knee procedure that he, he had during the offseason. But Del Rio, who has not shied away from publicly saying things about Jamin Davis in the past, did set some expectations for the first round pick as well saying quote, we had more splash plays and less. What the heck are you doing plays last year? And we need that trend to continue year three. Now we should expect him to be at the best at his best. And he's going to be challenged. I'll be honest with you because our guys are attacking it. I mean, they're doing a great job. Cody Barton's come in and he's shown that he's going to be a valuable piece for us. And guys like Khalid Hudson have been really playing outstanding. I think gained a little bit of confidence from that last outing against Dallas. He went out there, played really well. So he's coming off, coming to the offseason full of energy and getting a lot of reps because Jamin is not going. So when Jamin gets back, the key for him is going to be to eliminate some of the what the heck plays from his game and have some more of those splash plays. So, end quote. So Jack Del Rio certainly sending a message to Jamin Davis coming into his third season means he's the next man up for his fifth year option decision. That'll be coming up in the 2024 offseason. So this is the year for Jamin Davis to show the Washington Commanders. Do they want him as part of their future beyond his rookie contract, or do they need him to prove it even more? Uh, the option for linebackers this year 
would have cost about $12.7 million. That amount would make Davis at this point in time, a top 10 paid off ball linebacker, uh, according to annual average value. So usually those values only go up. So next year, uh, that value for 2026 could actually be, or for 2025 rather, could be closer to 13, maybe over $13 million. So Jamin Davis is going to have to show the team this year that he is indeed worth a $13 million investment in 2025. Uh, we also talked to special teams coordinator Nate Katzer, and his comments are coming up next on today's episode of Locked On Commanders. <laughs> Spoke to a lot of coaches on Thursday at uh, in Ashburn, Virginia, at the Commanders Compound. Uh, Special teams coordinator Nate Kazer is coming up next. We also talked to, well, I specifically also talked to uh, Juan Castillo, also talked to Randy Jordan, so we'll get more about that. Make sure you're keeping your eyes uh, open around the beat. Uh, Tavita Pritchard, quarterback coach, held court uh, for a little while. I mean, linebacker coach, wide receiver coach, defensive backs coach. There are a lot of coaches around. Couldn't get to them all. But we had a few solid, really solid conversations. The first conversation I had was with special teams coordinator Nate Katzer, who, by the way, I don't know if you know, this is a fan of Ted Lasso, said he was a little emotional about the last episode. So if you're a Lasso fan, you know what he's talking about. So got to sit down with Coach Katzer for about 10 minutes, and it's amazing the things uh, that you can learn from Coach Katzer just sitting there. But uh, Mitch Tissler of NBC Sports Washington got it started by asking about the new free kick rules. And I think this is the Second episode in a row that Mitch has gotten a shout out here on the uh, on the on the broadcast on the show. So if you're not following Mitch on on Twitter, make sure you do so. Uh, if you're not familiar with the rule, though, every day as we went over this not that long ago. But for those who may have missed that episode starting this season, not this preseason only, but this entire season. Right. There's not a test preseason and then they'll come back next year and make a decision. No, this entire year, this new rule is going into place. Free kicks, which come after scores. So kickoffs after touchdowns and field goals or safeties, free kicks after safeties, or of course, starting each half uh, can now be fair caught inside the 25. And if they are fair caught inside the 25, the ball will come out to the 25 yard line. That's where you start your drive. So this is a little bit different. And this is our first chance to talk to coach Katzer about it. And to paraphrase a little bit of what he said, because one of the great things about talking to coach Katzer is that he gives very thorough and detailed answers. You learn, like I said, you learn a whole lot. Uh, if, if the NFL didn't have these rules and policies uh, about airing in uh, this, you know, this isn't considered a TV show. So we have, we have a little bit different rules than like your local television stations. I would just air the entire comment that he gave us. Um, but unfortunately I can't do that here on the show, but here's some of what coach catch told us about this new free kick rule uh, that the team is working on as many scenarios as they can anticipate. They've got like a checklist. He said of all these scenarios that this new rule could bring up uh, and the ways that other teams could prevent them from potentially fair catching a kick or ways they could actually go about preventing a team from fair catching a kick inside the 25 and getting the ball back out on the 25. And, and, you know, again, how you can employ their methods, how you can employ your own methods. Um, if a team, and something that he brought up is, say, a team, maybe not the Washington Commanders, maybe another team out there, but say there is a team that's kind of being noticed around the league that they're fair catching the ball a lot, then other teams he anticipates could actually be putting the ball on the ground. We're talking squib kicks here, and the idea behind the squib kick is you force the return, right? You force the, the opposing team to return the ball, and that's something that they're also preparing for, and it's something... And I'm not going to lie. We saw this actually on the practice field. And I thought I was like, oh, they're, they're going over onside kick type stuff. But it was kind of weird because it was Antonio Gibson. It was Curtis Samuel. It was Jahan Dotson. It was some of those guys. Those aren't your hand teams guys usually, right? Like those are your deep returners. So that kind of clarifies like that's an explanation of what they were doing. They're kind of working on. Well, if a team out there decides we're going to start squib kicking because once the ball touches the ground, you can't fair catch it. So we're going to start squib kicking down onto the, onto the opponent's end of the field so that they have to field the kick and they have to return it. And, of course, you also open up the potential for a muffed kick, right? It bounces off the shoulder pads or takes a high skip over a guy's head, uh, something like that. They're definitely preparing for those possibilities. Coach Katzer acknowledged that it could create some scenarios, but it also could not. Like, that's, that's kind of the interesting thing about this rule change is could it be significant and very impactful? It could, but he also mentioned, like, we could go three weeks and not even realize. And then one time we say, oh, yeah, that rule changed. We forgot about that. So uh, it's going to be really interesting because they're they're definitely working on some contingency plans and some possibilities, something that could, di could directly impact the commanders. Last year, they were really, really excellent with uh, with pooch kicks. You can call them pooch kicks. They're just a little bit short, right? Forcing teams uh, to return kickoffs because, again, touchbacks 
uh, have a have a different advantage now uh, as well. So you kick the ball a little bit shorter. You allow your coverage team to get down the field, try to make a play, stop them before the touchback yard marker. Uh, but this year, again, that could be a little bit difficult. If you if you kick a ball straight up in the air, so to speak, uh, that guy can just fair catch it now, and, and now they get the ball in the 25, regardless of where you put it. So uh, really interesting. Something that Coach Kaiser uh, pointed out, his return specialists, all return specialists around the NFL, their understanding of hang time, their perception of how high a ball is actually going is going to be more important than ever before because of this rule. They are going to use some analytics to help them decide kind of which kicks they want to return, which ones are good for fair catching, which ones they want to just let go in for a touchback. So it's going to be a lot of math, a lot of data. Preseason work is going to be complicated, Coach Kazer told us, because let's say you go up against Baltimore Ravens and they're only working on squib kicks. Well, now you've got to work on squib kicks too because you can't tell them, hey, don't squib it. We want to work on something else. If they want to work on squibs, you now have to respond uh, and work on that recovery as well. But if they want to work on high kicks, you got to respond uh, to that as well. And vice versa, how you kick it is going to impact how they prepare. So um, some of those unknowns with the new rule, each team is going to be learning each other's approach to this new rule as we go. That's something that Coach Catch talked about as well as the, at the start of the regular season, like week one, you have no idea what to expect from your opponent as this rule pertains. So as you're going through the game, you're literally learning as you're going. Now, by week four, five, six, you'll have some more trends. That's where the analytics will come in all of those things, but it's going to be really interesting because this is a rule change that I think a lot of people are kind of just glossing over, right? But it's something that could be very, very impactful. Like we go back to the Green Bay Packers win uh, that the Washington Commanders had last year. Muff punts, a big reason for, for that win. There was a muff punt against the Chicago Bears in that Thursday night win. I mean, these things can certainly have uh, an impact, and, and the team, again, is bracing for some of these things. Now, there was a national narrative that Coach Kaiser uh, approached uh, that all special teams players – and coaches were unhappy about this rule change or had to be unhappy about this rule change. But he kind of clarified that there's a committee and there is input and that that and he, and he meant to say he didn't say directly that he had input on this rule change. But he did say things to the effect that it sounded like there were conversations before this rule change happened. Special teams coaches weren't just blindsided by this rule change. So it sounds like even if special teams coaches, you know, speaking generally, weren't necessarily in favor and love with the idea, they were at least aware of it and, and prepared uh, for the possible change to be coming. So, uh, again, I think the biggest thing here is that a fair catch can't be made on a on a bouncing ball, right? So I think that's something that Coach Kasser kind of hit right on the head. I think you could see some more squib kicks. And, uh, look, squib kicks are always a little bit interesting. It careens off of a guy's foot accidentally or it could lead to an up man uh, recovering a kickoff and having to return it unexpectedly. So uh, this this rule, you know, again, like, like Coach Kasser said, it could be nothing, but it could also create – some very interesting uh, scenarios and coaches are used to dealing with what ifs, but usually have some time, some time to study the impacts of trends. But this is really all happening in real time. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this thing uh, develops. Last thing I want to share from Coach Katzer, and this uh, actually might be the most interesting thing to you guys. I'm kind of a football nerd, so all that other stuff really interests me. But this might be the most interesting thing to a commander's fan. There is a return game competition. I brought it up to him. I said, look, outside of perception, Everybody thinks that there's going to be a punt return, you know, competition, kick return competition, that that job is nobody's. Coach Kazer did confirm to me that that, that competition is very real. Uh, Kazmir Allen is someone that we talked about at the table as having potential for to be a really explosive return guy. So he's working with uh, on some mechanics on just simply fielding the ball. We did talk about Dax Milne, and he did agree that there's a lot of, a lot of value in a guy like Dax Milne who simply catches the ball, secures it. Uh, he thinks that, you know, Again, fans and, and TV and from an excitement standpoint, very boring stuff, right? But from a special teams aspect and a team aspect, having a guy who can secure the ball time in and time out. Uh, he made the analogy. There's a lot of things in sports where if you do it seven out of 10 times, eight out of 10 times, that's really good averages, right? And I think about baseball, if you get on base seven or eight at times out of every 10 trips to the plate, you're going to be an all-star in the kick return game, in the putt return game. If you only catch seven or eight out of every 10 balls, you're going to get cut. So I think that's a very valuable point. Uh, also mentioned Chris Rodriguez's potential usage on special teams in several role, punt protector, return pursuit man, up man on returns, pointing to Chris's past work in return special teams uh, in college and also as a rusher to block the punt, almost like a linebacker running back hybrid uh, on special teams. So really exciting stuff there. So you can expect to probably see six round rookie running back Chris Rodriguez Jr. Uh, playing some special teams here this season for the Washington Commanders. There's going to be a return specialist battle in training camp and in the preseason. So get ready for that. And 
uh, this new free kick rule could have some impact, could not have some impact, but if it does have an impact, it's going to be really, really interesting to watch NFL return return specialists have to chase around these bouncing balls on the field, especially you get to December, you get to like Lambeau and that field is frozen. I mean, it could hit any which way. So very interesting stuff that could uh, lead to some interesting moments in the season. But coming up next week, we're back every day. Once again, every day is I will need your questions. We are going to have another Tuesday afternoon mailbag. I will be in Ashburn Tuesday afternoon. Those who will not be live. I will record it ahead of time. But if you have questions, drop them in the comments here on YouTube. Hit me up on Twitter, email or uh, on subtext. In the meantime, if you've got other questions or comments, just throw them in the live chat. Again, YouTube comments, Twitter, email me at lockedoncommanders at gmail.com or send them to me directly via subtext. As always, thank you for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day, every day, every day. Thanks for coming through on a consistent basis like you do. And remember, we can continue this conversation over at joinsubtext.com slash Commanders. Thank you so much for making me part of your day part of your routine. And if you have anything else Washington Commanders related that you want to know or want to discuss, make sure you also follow me on Twitter at dharrison82. Till we speak again, be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.